And one of the first subjects you hit on in this book, a really big one is sugar and our overconsumption of sugar. And you really broke it down that it's not all, you know, all sugar is the culprit. It's just we've concentrated and processed sugar so much that it's stripped of us all its nutrients and super concentrated and addictive. But can you go into what we need to know about sugar as it relates to obesity in modern times? I think one thing that people forget is that most of the sugar is being consumed by children. Mm. Okay, That's the key. And by the time they're 20, 25, 30, that huge amount of sugar that they were consuming most of their lives has already caught up to them. So that even if they start eating a somewhat lower amount of sugar, they're already basically overweight, obese, high blood pressure, et cetera. And so there's a lot of people who have argued, okay, there are certain graphs that around 1970 sugar intake hit like 120 pounds per person per year. And it slowly started going a little bit down as the obesity epidemic started increasing. Okay. There are certain charts that will show that, but the problem is that's looking at the average sugar intake, not the sugar intake in the children. Hmm. So typically on average, children are consuming about 200 grams of sugar uh, per day. So they're consuming a third of their calories from added sugar. And so when you do that for 10, 20 years um, early on, that causes severe metabolic damage. So that even if now you're only consuming 50 grams of sugar, that's too much now, the body can't handle it. And so it's really that early stage sugar intake that leads to dramatic harm later on. And one of the things people don't know, but I actually read, and I'll quote you here, studies suggest that added sugars are as addictive as cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. And we're feeding that to kids, right? I mean, isn't, isn't that part of the problem? This is what I always get into people with. The one free Krispy Kreme donut isn't the problem. I get it. You won't get you know obese or have metabolic dysfunction from the one, but it's going to lead you to want more. Isn't that the whole thing that you just have a little bit, but then you get cravings as if it were cocaine? I mean, that's a very addictive substance. So isn't that the problem with sugar? Yes. I mean, at least so if you look at the animal studies, animals will actually basically induce death in themselves by consuming so much sugar. In other words, they will eat a diet that's lacking in nutrients that will lead to an early death if it's filled with sugar because they will constantly consume that. And so when you think about it from that perspective, you always have people saying, well, sugar in moderation, right? But it's like telling an alcoholic alcohol in moderation, right? It doesn't make sense for a subset of people. So we're not here to say that sugar is addictive for everyone, just like alcohol isn't addictive for everyone, right? But when you put it in a food and it's hidden, you don't even realize that you're getting it. And then when you add, um, like when you process it and you put it and package it with added fats, now you have this super hyper palatable food that does become addictive to for a lot of people. So if I'm a parent and I see my child is eating too much sugar, is slightly overweight, uh, you know, what would be your advice of how I could pivot off of that since it is quite addictive. And I think just completely going off any sh- sugar substitutes may be difficult for a child's palate. Right. And I think the easiest thing is to start substituting some of that added sugar with just real fruit, whether, whether it be watermelon, whether it be berries, something to give that child the sugar that their, their cells are used to using, but in a more healthier uh, form. Yeah. Now let's talk about refined carbs. Uh, you know, what are they and how do they contribute to obesity? Because you hear about it a lot, but I feel like some people don't even really understand what that means by refined carbs. So when you refine a carb, essentially in the, in the late 1800s, they invented something called the steel roller mill, which basically pulverized uh, basically grains and wheat into a very fine powder. And so the coarseness of powder will determine high, how high your blood sugar spikes and then also if it will cause hypoglycemia. So the coarser grains that are sort of stone ground lead to a smaller spike in glucose, a smaller spike in insulin, and they actually typically don't cause hypoglycemia. And so you don't get this, the, the constant sugar cravings from the cycles of, in the dips in your blood sugar. But when you consume a highly refined grain, you get a much higher spike in insulin and glucose and you go low glu- uh, blood glucose or hypoglycemic. And so that's the difference is the particle size. Now, this isn't to say that eating stone ground flour is healthy. You know, it's small amounts is probably fine for many people, especially if you add it with proteins and fats. But 
The typical even 100% whole grains in the United States are typically ran through a steel roller mill. So even if it has the whole grain symbol on it, it's typically a refined grain and it is not healthy. It will lead to the high blood sugars and the crashes.